Hi, everybody. This is Martha Creek. You can contact me, marthacreek.com. And my mission is to serve those who serve. And I have a vision of getting empowered teachings out to the whole of humanity. So this podcast series is along those lines to fulfill that and to move in the direction of that. And I have this very special guest today um, that, has, uh, that is coming on here to join us at a time that is, I think, uh, highly, highly auspicious with what's going on in the world. She's also wholehearted in the way that she serves the world, um, Reverend Cherie Taylor Jones, and how she has been living her life and living a life on purpose. And just yesterday, I got a new definition about a life on purpose, which is that of finding something that brings you joy and mm. something that grows you and something that you know in certainty is making a difference in the lives of others. So even without knowing that, these are this is what was guiding me subconsciously to pick the people that I've picked for this podcast. So thank you. Thank you, friend and teacher and, and colleague and sister for being on here today. And we've talked a little bit before we started the recording to take on a, a conversation that I believe is critical, vital and necessary, and especially now in the face of what's going on in the world and the culture and in our history. And I'm absolutely committed then in devoting this time and this conversation to being a contribution, a contribution to undoing and a contribution to creating and causing and generating something different in the lives of humans and especially black lives. So we'll start here, honey. So thank you for joining me and thank you for your heart, your willingness to say, let's talk about it. You know, let's put this out, see what can be used here. So I believe, honey, what's on my mind is I ask you, um, even before we started this, like, give me some insight, give me and listeners some insight w without believing that there's a quick fix to anything or that there's a blanket statement, you know, us white people can make that's going to heal everything or, or, or make things right that's been wronged and so wrong now for millennia. What could you say to me, honey, or say to us, say to the listeners that might be helpful in the spirit of bringing healing and reconciliation? What could be helpful? Yeah. Um, first, thank you for um, facilitating the discussion um, and the willingness and for us to create a new way of having a conversation about something that's difficult to have a conversation about. Um, I think for many of us, we're so, um, we don't want to hurt people's feelings, you know, by putting our foot in our mouths or um, something to that effect. And like you said, there isn't one formula that we can embrace to say, okay, so if I do step one, two, three, then it'll be okay and I can, I, I can be all right in the world. Um, I think that what's going on right now is... Um, it's an amazing, like I call it, we are on the precipice of great transformation in our society and our culture on the planet. Um, and I believe that we've truly all said yes to being here right now because we can facilitate this shift. Um, and so for me, the facilitating, I don't think I could have had this conversation like six months ago from the same con. Um, construct and the same centeredness that I can have it today. And I think part of that is because I've been traveling across the country and you probably are like, what has this got to do with this conversation? Well, it's poignant because I really think I got that if I was raised in the environment of some folks with the same type of family systems and school systems and support systems that I would believe the way that they believed. And so what that gives me now is not that it's okay for people to be filled with hatred or biases, but what it gives me is it gives me this sense of compassion 
to have for people who are different than me, for people who think differently than I do, for people whose worldviews are completely opposite of my worldview. And so what that now allows is for me to not react like in this, oh, how could you, you know, how could you be a racist? Don't you understand? Now I get to be in this place of, well, of course you are. It makes sense. How could you be anything else but? Um, and so my first step with this process is first to give people the clarity that if you are raised in the Western culture, if you are educated in Western society, you have biases. We all have biases. I have biases that I work on regularly. But what that gives is permission now that you know as a human being on planet Earth, you have biases. So there's nothing to be like, oh, how could I think that way? Of course you think that way. That's, that's part of the conditioning. That's part of the indoctrination. And once you're now aware that that is part of our DNA just from being on planet Earth, it takes away that indignation or that defensiveness that that can't possibly be me. It is. So now we get to breathe into the reality of, I'm a human being with biases. No, no problem. No, I don't have to blame myself or blame society or blame my mom or blame my parents or grandparents. I now have the accountability and responsibility to say, does this bias make sense in the life that I want and the life that I want to create on planet Earth? That's a huge shift now. Well, that's also taking responsibility for ourselves. So then, honey, regardless of how we were raised or educated or what was going on in our homes, which we can't undo, or what right. went into the system or the school to say, nevertheless, I'm going to take some responsibility for this now, which you said powerfully that it's my responsibility to not point at my fingers at the bias you have, you have, you have, and you're, you're biased and you're that. And I got that at a very early age. Like I was prejudiced against prejudice <laughs> and yeah. I'm biased and prejudiced against bigotry and other things like that. And I could see as a young girl, that's not going to be helpful here. Right. My own prejudice may not be the prejudice they have, but it's still prejudice. So that I've got to work to clear that in order for me to have any kind of effect on how we may evolve here. And it's, it, it's helpful then to hear, um, and thank you that you don't, that you also don't believe that there's some kind of quick fix or some formula here. But it, mm. it, you didn't use those words. It's my words, uh, Cherie, that there's a direction to go in here. And that it means then owning any bias, not do I have bias? Where do I have bias? What right. is going on in that bias? And what can I do to shift the mindset of that bias? Knowing right. that we have the inertia of 2000 years since creation, it's been in place. So the, the binds and the bonds and the, and the, um, the, 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 um, inertia of that 2000 years since creation of this going on, it's no little thing to move it even a hair to, to come out of this. So I've, I've been curious, actually not just curious, as dramatic as the word sounds, mystified. Mystified at how we can be raised in the same house, same parents, same schools, eat the same food, and be so polarized on matters like this so that I hear people say that I'm on the polar extreme of my sibling or I'm on the polar extreme of the majority in my family it's like speak to that honey what what what, what would you say about it um, um I'm shaking my head and smiling because I have one sibling a brother um, and you know when you say that I'm like we are so opposite you know his um, he's just completed 25 years as a corrections officer. 
in a maximum security um, facility. Um, so his mindset is completely the antithesis of mine. And um, same parents, same household, same everything. And, you know, what that, what that brings is um, we, we definitely have that starting off point. And then, you know, we experience life. And we have um, all of these life experiences that teach us different lessons, right? I mean, that's what we're here for. And so my path is um, light and love, and his path is very, you know, blue, if you believe in spiral dynamics about rules, regs, and, you know, you're guilty really until proven innocent. So, um, you know, we love each other, but we don't have much conversations, you know, to be honest. And, um, and I think that's, that's got to be okay. I think all of us are really necessary for this journey. You know, those who are radicals about, you know, protesting and um, calling out the injustices, they are necessary. You know, those who are um, racist and biased, they are necessary as well. And I know that sounds really weird to say, but I'll give you a for instance. Um, when Trump was first elected, my community is, was a very liberal community and they were up in arms that, you know, this was like the end of the world for them. And for me, it was really clear that Trump is in divine order. What he's able to do is to allow all the shadows that is part of the American system, um, part of the economic system, part of the caste system that is America to really come to light that we no longer were hiding behind oh what happened in the 60s with the civil rights movement that's complete now there is no racism um, so what I, when I say that even racists and people that are biased are necessary what it does is it brings all of that to the light for us to look at our own shadows to look at our own beliefs around otherness, you know, otherness, and then decide to heal that. But until we see it, we don't know that there's anything to heal. And so that's why I say that every one of us is necessary and vital in, in our piece of this and our piece to it. Um, and until we're able to really come into that type of integration, um, and not say this person is evil, but this person is necessary to shine light on issues that we have and that we are now ready to deal with. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, honey. And it's whether it's popular or not, you know, everybody's got their own opinions about that too, about just like that, where somebody, we can say he, that in this case, the president is necessary. The president has been, uh, has opened a portal to what's in the shadow uh, to say, right. there's, there's no keeping this under wraps anymore. There's no like sweeping this under the rug that whatever rug we swept this under, we're tripping over now. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and quickly tripping over. And it's, it's, um, it's, there's a pile up from the, from the tripping up. There's a pile up of this. Um, that then, then says, okay, let's shine a light on this. So um, I also think I've, I've, I've witnessed that um, this need, we spoke a little bit about it before I started our session together today, that this knee jerk reaction in me to like do something, do something, do something, do something that I wouldn't do. And I've had to balance that with um, appreciating other people that are doing, appreciating people that are taking integral action, right action, according to what their beliefs are and according to what they think is going to be effective. And I've been more discerning during this time than I've ever been about what I actually believe would be effective and what I'm willing to put my time and energy in instead of kind of this shotgun approach to just shoot something. And, and I don't mean somebody, but yes. shoot a bunch of ideas out there or shoot a bunch of actions out there and hope it lands somewhere about, I want to be much more refined 
about how I'm going to do this. And David Hawkins works comes to mind about come from a place of power or then whatever, whatever becomes of it is sustainable versus right. coming from a place of force, which you may get some change. You may get a reaction. You may get a situation to kind of shift, but it's not sustainable. And I believe that that's the time we're in now too, to come from these places like these leaders, the leaders that we respect have come from a place that said, it's going to, it's going to take longer than you like. Period. Mm -hmm. There is not a quick fix to this. And that um, there, what is right for me is not right for somebody else. And that this righteousness and this righteous indignation is digs us deeper in a hole than it does to dig us out of a hole, regardless of which end of the spectrum you're on or which camp you're in or which uh, end of the, which polarity, you know, is, is mm -hmm. act, the most active right now. So I would also love you to speak to um, where's the hope? Where, where, what do you think the hope is? Where is hope? A hope that's grounded hope, you know, that's not this, you know, I can't bear, you know that about me, these folks that say, that stand out in the rain soaking wet and swear they're not, stand out in the rain soaking wet and swear they're not wet. You know, like a snap out of it, <laughs> like you're wet. So you affirming that it's not raining or you affirming that you're dry doesn't make you dry. So I'm interested in then where do you see the hope in this that is a grounded hope that there's a real potential here, not just this we're going to gloss over something or pretend that we did something or read a book on racism and then check it off like it's a tick box exercise and, and read a book. By all means, read a book. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to lead a book study. I'm going to lead a book group. I'm going to really take a deep inner dive at how this has got a hold of me. Mm -hmm. And how I'm contributing to something unconsciously, like I'm not doing so consciously, but how I'm absolutely contributing to some way unconsciously, subconsciously, that is not okay with me anymore. So ironing out any wrinkle of that. So I'm not against reading books. I'm, what I'm encouraging is as listeners to say, then what? Right. Yeah. Then, and then where so I want to just hope is. Yep. I want to first talk about the righteous indignation. Righteous indignation can be a trap, but it can also be the spark of fire that someone needs to get off their butt and do something. So I'm not opposed to righteous indignation if it um, allows that person to really um, come to terms with their truth, um, comes to terms with their power, because um, used anything that we feel or um, suggest used in the right way can, can really transform the planet. Um, I think the hope comes from really being clear on what you're passionate about. So, you know, like you, I really had to go within and be uncomfortable in sitting for a while to discern, you know, what's mine to do? How can I, add to this and not detract from it. Um, so we have to be comfortable with sitting with the uncomfortability for a little while. Um, and I think that's where a lot of us reside right now in not sure what to do, what steps to take, um, how do I step out in a different way. Um, and there's fear. There's fear that the world is changing and we don't know what it's going to change into. And a lot of us are very comfortable. Let's face it, the status quo has been a blessing for non-people non of color. It's been wonderful. And so why would we intentionally want to change that? So we really have to go within and get clear on our beliefs. What do we believe? Do we really believe the hype that's being portrayed in the media or wherever we get our information from? Do we believe in scarcity that there's only enough for like one segment of the population and so we have to uphold this unjust systems because that 1% of the population is more deserving than 
others, well then, what do you really believe? Are, are you believing in abundance? Are you believing in God? Or are you believing in this um, broken systems that completely say there is not enough for everyone and only a few can thrive? So I think that's, that's a starting off point, uh, looking at our beliefs and sitting with that uncomfortability until we get that spark that tells us, oh, this really, this, I'm so fired up about this. I've got to whatever. Wait for it. It's going to, it's there. It will tell you, you don't have to force anything just to be seen as doing something, right? So wait for that because that spark is where the power is. That spark is going to really catapult you into taking the steps that are necessary to transform our world. Um, so, you know, that's, and there's impatience with that. If you're like me, you're really impatient. You don't want to sit in the uncomfortability. You want to get out there and change the world. And I hear that. And I still had to sit. And I'm grateful that I got a spark of what's, you know, mine to do in this short term. I'm waiting for more sparks because I think there's more to do. But what I find in um, my speaking out like this virtually and having the conversations, it's like my whole body is just like percolating, you know, and I feel like if one person hears this and it changes them, then there's that ripple effect. And look at, look at what I'm doing. I'm helping to transform this planet and shift in consciousness. Do you hear that energy? That energy is the hope. That energy is where we go for transformation, my friends. And so if you're in that chrysalis as the butterfly does, as it's in that goop of, well, we're changing. I know something great is going to happen wait for it. Listen, go within, start with what biases am I carrying right now? And where can I shift? Right? Start there. And as you start there, the awakenings can't help but come. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely really resonate with that, honey. And it's like, one and it, when I do one thing, then I can do one more, then one more, then one more. So it's like these steps are not little steps, even though it may seem like yes, minimal. It's not minimal if you believe in quantum theory or quantum effect or butterfly effect or whatever that says there's no thought, no word I speak, no thought I hold, no action that I take. It's either strengthening me and therefore strengthening the whole, or it's weakening me and therefore weakening the whole. So there's nobody that's, um, that can't contribute here and that is contributing here, whether it's purposefully, purposefully co uh, contributing, intentionally committing, or doing so out of our um, asleepness or our uh, homeostasis or mm -hmm. of the old way. So I read a story and part of what's already been beneficial to me is to hear people direct the stories about how they've been discriminated against so that I believe that bringing discrimination into reality, that it's not a theory of discrimination or an idea of discrimination, uh, then we can say, oh, of sure, of course there's discrimination, of sure. And it's like, but without ever knowing the depth of it without ever knowing what that discrimination meant to a soul, what that discrimination meant to a person, what that, what that discrimination meant to a relationship or to a profession or to a job or to a home or to a life experience. So that's been one of the greatest um, shifters in me is of taking the time to read somebody's story about how discrimination has affected them. So I'm committed to doing that now daily. And I've, and I've, and so regardless of how much I've done before, you know, I just noticed myself wanting to defend, I've been doing that, you know, I work at that. It's like, regardless of how much I've done, I've committed again to reading a story of somebody unlike me that has experienced something atrocious, unlike me, every single day. So that's one thing I can do and I'm doing. And so today's reading 
came from a man that is a professor that was out to lunch, walking from his car to a burrito shop and was stopped by police. And before he knew it, it's one police and then four police cars. And they said, basically, and you can read this online, it's very public. It's basically that somebody had called them that somebody fitting his description had just tried to break in their home. And he said, I, I've, I, I've went from my car to here. And it's like, you fit the description, you fit the description. What is the description? And it was um, black, so, so and so tall, so and so weight, which he wasn't wearing a certain knitted cap that he wasn't wearing. And how he knew that the more he said, the worse it's going to get. Right. And that he had to stand there and say just what he meant. Um, I work right over there. <laughs> My car's right over there. He had to prove his ID. He had to show this. He was wearing his lanyard of employment. And he went on and on. And more people came, higher, more authority came. And he said the most frightening part of it was he knew that he's not going to get in that police car. That he will not accept that one white woman who thinks he's a criminal will cause him to get in a police car to where he doesn't know what's going to happen from there. And how frightening that was, because then that means that he would be resisting arrest. Right. And then it's going to get very dicey from there. Right. And then they were going to bring the woman to him. Because uh, they were going to take him to the woman. And he said, I, I, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I wasn't doing that. I wasn't getting in that police car without force. And then they said, they're going to bring the woman to him. So his demise was held in the throes of one white woman looking at him and saying, he's, he's the one, he's the criminal. And he wasn't, nor had he ever been. So this is one little piece of sand in a mighty big beach of ocean of what people are living under, daily living under. When they leave their place of employment, 25 years a professor, to go get a burrito. And, um, in your words, honey, is that necessary? Because if it's reality, then it has to happen. It had to happen on that occasion just because it did, not because it's right, not because it wasn't discriminatory, but because it exists, it had to happen. So it was necessary for something, for his learning, for his lesson, for a, a police staff to learn, to see what non-resistance would look like, who knows. But it's these stories that have sparked me and that have sparked me. Um, and I believe that I live in gratitude. A lot of gratitude has been important to me since I was a kid, but it's like, I don't know gratitude yet. I don't know mm. that nothing, nothing like that, nothing close to like that has ever been in my realm, nothing. And then my favorite part about humans is their stamina their resilience, their willingness to get up again, get up again, find a way, find a work around to live through this. And then today's reading also included the need for contemplation and like really contemplating these things instead of believing that we really know what's going on and acting like we know what's going on versus mm. contemplating what really is going on here. 
and using contemplation and how slaves from those many years ago that were brought over as property use contemplation for survival. It's how they contemplated a higher order or they contemplated um, their creator. They contemplated, they, they went into communion with something bigger than them just to navigate the winds of that. And so this, this um, sense of communion and this sense of contemplation, um, I think is, could be helpful here for, for me, certainly, and for anybody that's willing to do it, to, to contemplate the magnitude of this that goes far, far, far beyond an occurrence or far, far beyond a situation or what we read in the news today. So um, just speak, honey, anything that's on your heart or mind about what you could say to me or to others um, that may have a commitment to be a part of this change and to move this needle further down the road without knowing how, um, well, how could you encourage us to continue to do um, what we're called to do to use our sparks um, any way that you can about um, encouraging? Well, I think one of the things that people get stymied about is that there is a different walk when you're a person of color. And so if you can imagine that from the time someone of color leaves their home, um, their walk is very different than your walk. Meaning that for me, when I leave my home, you know, I look at people and I make eye contact um, as much as possible to show that I'm in here and I'm human just like they are, you know. Um, I walk in the world knowing that people are just judging me because of the color of my skin. You know, that whatever the labels or the um, narratives are, um, that's the box that they're putting me into. And I have no control over that. I have no control of being treated differently just because of the color of my skin. And as I travel around the country, you know, Graham, my husband is white. Um, just the way that we approach things sometimes are so different. You know, I'm much more of okay let's let's be aware let's you know are we are we scoping out everything um and his is just like oh, i'm just walking in the world you know so if you could just imagine like if you could just imagine wearing a mask for a day a mask of color you know and really stepping out in the world and what kind of drip 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 that is on your soul, um, I think that that would give you a new understanding of, 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 of the life of someone of color, you know, because it's really hard to imagine um, walking any other way. Um, so I would invite you to do that, um, because I think it would then give you some uh, breath of, of compassion and understanding. Uh, for what is going on in the world and um, for this world to really shift we have to be clear that the idea of race is a construct and it's a construct of one people to have power over another people that's really the, the existence of race. And the reality is that there is only one race, the human race, that we all belong to. And um, what would life be like if we didn't subscribe to the different races, that we really understood the truth, that we are all of God, that the spark of the divine is, flows through each and every one of us. And so we are a divine human on this planet right now. And we have this amazing opportunity to call the constructs fake, 
to call the constructs myths. And then from there, we get to now build new constructs that really allow each and every divine human being to be treated equally the same as a sense of belonging with respect and love and just happy that they're part of the human race. That's the world I want to live in. And I hope that together we get to create that. Me too. Me too. And I've noticed through this, um, there's been a tendency to go and speak about how you've been discriminated about a woman as a woman. Speak about how you've been discriminated as a heavy woman, a heavier woman. Speak about, speak about, speak about. And it's like, I don't, it's like, I, now's not the time to speak about those things. And somebody will speak about them. Somebody's writing books about that. Somebody's writing, um, doing virtual <laughs> conversations <laughs> about that. And it doesn't diminish that, the importance of that. And it's not going to serve as a detractor here to say we've got a real opportunity and auspicious time to look at what racism is in our own heart, in our own mind, in our own subconscious, and to say what we can do with it. And I've been re so reflective, especially reflective since this last occurrence of this. And I brought a, a friend of mine from Florida home with me to Buck Tussle. And we marched right in this restaurant where my mom worked and me and my passel, you know, or is that the word for it? Me and my, me, you know, my gaggle, my, my, my little congregation, <laughs> we all come in, these people traipsing around with me. And when we walked in that restaurant, it's like every, the whole restaurant went quiet. It was surreal. And I, could, I had no idea. I was so naive, so naive about it. And I noticed it and I'm like, what, what's going on here? Did somebody die? Not a word. And my mother said, are you kidding me that you don't know what happened there? Mm. I have no idea. And it was as honest as anything. And she said, you brought a black man in there. Now, they had never met him. They've never seen him. They don't know a thing about him, his life. And this is the effects of this. And then I got to looking into that. And that very county where we were was one of the last counties to shift out of um, their uh, torture and abuse of people of color lynching and God knows what else. So mm -hmm. then, and I've known this from my own studies that even though those people at those tables didn't lynch, it's in their bones and blood. That's right. It's in their bones and blood. So they're in a reaction without even understanding their own reaction to it. And I was, I was doing a family constellation not too long ago and there was, there was scientific proof brought into that particular environment of how two generations down, how we're still in reaction to it as though it happened to us, although it did, but it's in our bones and blood too. So I have to keep that in mind. Um, and, and to your point, honey, which is poignant and brilliant. And one of my takeaways today is to continue to look to see what is in my bones and blood yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the effects of what's there. And then more importantly, what am I going to do about that? Because right. Purification processes and my own purification of mind, my own pur purification of belief systems or whatever else it is. Yeah. Because until we do that inner work, we're not going to be able to do the outer work. You know, it always starts with us. You and I both know that. Um, but sometimes we get caught up in so much of the outside that we forget whatever's going on is, is the out picturing on the outside. And it's hard sometimes for us to remember that. So until we get the clarity inside, until we do our own work, um, what we do outside is not going to be as effective and long lasting. I'm, um, committed again, me and more deeply committed and. I encourage you to um, 
hold me to it. And whatever, whatever way that may look like, because I can promise you it is whatever the antic I pull that would be dis discriminatory or hateful or cruel. It's absolutely subconsciously. It's unconscious. And I work to stay conscious and work to stay not ruled by the subconscious. Right. And I can't do what I can't do. And if a cat will still eat a bird after a million years of domestication, I'm just a thought away from hurting somebody. Yes. And I've got to accept that too. Yes. So, yes, with love and compassion. Well, and I believe there's real power in that, honey. And, and that um, compassion is um, not a tick box exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> we're expanding to how to be more and more, more and more compassionate, more and more compassionate, which for me includes holding compassion for all parties, all parties. And, and I still have to do something. Yep. Yes. Yes, it's an and. Yeah. Um, what, how would you want to close, honey? What would you say? Any final words here that you want to put forth, honey? Believing that who knows how this will reach or who knows what lives could be changed here? Like, what would you want to put forth? I would say that you are necessary. Each and every one of you is necessary for this transformation on the planet. Um, and we are at the tipping point. And so I ask you to really just be kind to yourself and compassionate to yourself as you do this work. And the work is to look at your biases, to see them, they are there, own them, and then say, what is mine to do? How do I shift that? Who do I need to talk to? You know, do that work. And then together, we are going to change this planet. I believe that. Amen, sister. So um, I thank you for that. And I believe it too. And whether it's hope or false hope or eternal optimism, I'm still smart. So in that yes. hi, ho, hi ho, back in that direction we go. Um, so tell us, honey, the listeners how to best contact you, of what you're about, what your writing's about, your own podcast series. So put that forth here so they can. Sure. Um, the best way to reach me is probably at preachitsister.com. And it's not preachitsister.com. You've got to go preachitsister.com. That's how you can find me. And um, I do work on belief systems. I have a book out that's called Turning Your Why into Why Not. And it's a really gentle and loving approach at looking at what your beliefs are, um, allowing you to realize that, yes, you're human. Yes, you have biases. And now what? And it gives you some steps that you can take to shift those biases. I also have a podcast called Belief Busters. Guess what that's about? Shifting your belief system. And I um, have guests and we look at different topics that are, are coming up currently. And uh, we work through that. And it was a blessing to have Martha on that podcast as well. So if you get a chance to listen to it and to follow it, it's Belief Busters. And you can find that on like Spotify or iTunes. Thank you for that. It was great fun that day, honey. And for those of you listening, if this is a little too heavy conversation for you, then listen to it twice instead of speaking <laughs> So that may not be as heavy next time. And then if you want further torture, look up that podcast where Reverend <laughs> Cherie interviewed me because I basically ask you and encourage you to make peace with your body, regardless of which yes. body you got and what body shape you have. So um, there's, there's more possibilities for us there too, particularly in, in transforming our BS, our belief system. So it means the world to me to have you here, honey, for you to sit, for you to take on a dialogue, a conversation about this. It's, it's um, I absolutely devoted then to my own transformation for my own soul's progression and that of your soul, our own evolutionary process. And, and I devote this time and energy to this evolution of humanity. And so it is. <laughs> so it is. And we begin again. Thank yes. You. Much love to you.
MarthaCreek.com to contact me. And there's free videos, audios, podcasts, YouTube channel, anything there that will serve you in any way, you're welcome to have it. And you're also free to use it, to duplicate it, to copy it, to send it out, to do whatever if you believe it's going to get empowered teachings to the planet. That's what it's intended for. So till we meet again, all blessings and be the first and be quick to offer grace to yourself so that you can be first and quick to offer grace to others. And so it is. Amen. Amen.